One of the questions that has come from, from a couple of you is the question, are there any circumstances, any circumstances whatsoever in which the Army might intervene in the governance of Egypt again? That's a predictive question. Don't blame me, blame them. <laughs> Especially the person with nice handwriting that's probably up there. <laughs> No, no, I'll answer after you. Any, <laughs> any, any circumstances. This particular you are, question, you are, you are, I will answer after you. You are coming from a military background, so it's probably... X, X. The question is directed to you. I mean, if you ask me, of course, okay. I, don't, I don't want this to happen, but... Uh. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is uh, a question and talk in... F I mean, everywhere in Egypt. Um, people, when things are getting really difficult, uh, people start to talk about uh, why the army can't come now and put order in the street. We, people are suffering from uh, instability, security instability. We're talking about, uh, I just said that this morning, uh, ten, more than 10 million pieces uh, of weapons between uh, um, Egyptian hands illegally without any uh, license. Uh, and it's not, again, my figure because somebody in, in the morning uh, said it's uh, where from get you this figure. I, uh, this figure has been announced by the, the, by the former prime minister of Egypt. It's not my figure. Uh, so I, I assume it's correct figure. I'm, I'm not sure if the prime minister will lie, but I don't think so. Uh, the thugs everywhere in Egypt, um, uh, Egypt is not secured anymore like before. Uh, not only Cairo, I'm talking about uh, the entire Egypt. When people see that, they said, oh, we need somebody to put order in the street. We need to move freely. Uh, I don't like uh, my kid to be kidnapped. And uh, somebody will call me and, and tell me, uh, you have to pay ransom to give your kid back, which is happening every day. Uh, people stop you in the highway and get your car with a machine gun in daylight. So when people see that, uh, they said, oh, we need the army to come down and put order in the street. Uh, so they are hoping for that. This is the last line of defense they are talking about. That's what they wish. But whether the army will do that or not, that's another thing. Uh, again, people are expecting Egypt, again, I'm sure my friend and others, who, uh, some others, uh, will not accept what I'm talking about. But people, they're talking about this in Egypt now, that the country will, will may fail. The country will make collapse. Uh, uh, hunger revolution will be in the street. People will come and, and, and broke your door and take your things from your home. People are afraid of that. People are really scared about that. So they say before getting that, why not the army comes down again and put order in the street? So it's a wishful thinking. But whether the army will do that or not, very doubtful, unless it is the last Think you can do unless this is the only way to save the country when really things get really ugly that's something else uh, in my opinion the issue of uh, security is a bit overplayed uh, yes there are security problems uh, yes the Egyptian society is less secure than it used to be but uh, I think the security issue is, is an issue everywhere. Uh, I'll give you an example, a very close example. I was, before I came to Williamsburg, I was in uh, Houston visiting my daughter. I have a, a daughter living there. And uh, one day she went uh, shopping and then she was putting gas in her car. And all of a sudden, a guy came and, uh, and uh, stole her uh, bag from the car, from the other side of the car, and, and ran away. That was 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, it was very sunny, you know, very nice. Uh, uh, of course, she came back crying to, to us, and we went to the store, and we started to ask the guy. I mean, uh, we, we, we realized that there are cameras, you know, in, at the, right next to the, uh, the, the tanks that, uh, that must have recorded everything. So we, we asked the guy uh, if we can see this or the police can see that and, 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 and can do something. And then he said something that was very surprising to me. He said, do you know how many times this happens? I told him how many. He said five times a day. He said at that, that, part, that particular location that was in front, in, in the middle of Houston, uh, Kroger supermarket, five times a day at this particular location, this is repeated. Sometimes it is, that was of course something a, a bit minor, but sometimes it's more severe than that. So, some, sometimes people are hurt, some, you know. 
So I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, of course, by saying this, I'm not invite, I'm inviting the US Army to come and intervene and, uh, and take charge of the security. But what I'm saying is that security is now becoming an issue everywhere in the world. And the, the reason for the security problem in Egypt is not because the, the, the army uh, is not interfering. It is because <coughs> the, 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 the police is not doing its job. This is the job of the police. This is the job of the, uh, the security force. So these people have to be prepared and trained to do their job to maintain security. And this is something that needs time because the, the, the entire police force was really established uh, based on rules that are not valid anymore. That was, every, everything was centered towards the security of the ruler, the security of the regime rather than the security of the people. So naturally, the police force is not really well trained to, to take care of the security of the society. And this needs time to be established. The military can help rehabilitating the police force to, to be able to do their roles. I'm, 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 I'm almost sure that we are not going to face something like uh, uh, hunger uh, demonstrations at the streets. This is something that never happens in a, in a country like Egypt. Uh, uh, and, uh, and even if things really deteriorate, we hope now that through democratic means, things are restored. Uh, 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 if people do not like the ruler, there are democratic ways to get rid of the ruler. So uh, I hope that we really do not have to go back again to the era where the only or the last resort is having inviting the army to take charge of the of running the country again. Th th this raises, thank you. This raises one of the other questions I want to ask the general. Uh, Dr. Drag talked about separating the role of the the police and, and domestic intelligence from protecting the government to protecting the individual. Do you agree that the role of internal security has changed and? What does the process look like whereby Egypt accure, uh, reacquires the, the domestic security that had characterized Egypt for many decades prior to, to 2011? Having said that uh, the army doesn't want to go back to the street and, uh, and uh, to put order in the street, uh, but again, uh, uh, they have been forced to go to the street a couple of months ago by an order from the president, existing president in Port Said. In Port Said. Uh, the uh, Port Said is, a, of course, it's a governorate in the middle in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the beginning of Suez Canal in the north of Egypt. Uh, for people uh, who doesn't know where it's Port Said, and uh, Port Said were at the time getting out of control from the police, and people start to target the police. Uh, people in Port Said start to target the police and shoot them and kill them and all this, and getting inside the police stations and. Uh, and hitting them hard and all this kind of stuff. Then the police, they said, oh, we cannot do it anymore. Please help. So uh, the president uh, um, uh, set a curfew and asked the army to go down. As soon as the army went down, again, as soon as the army went down and the police took their hand off, all the military stopped. No rights, no killing, nobody touched anybody. In fact, the people of Port Said who start, who, who used to be to kill the officers, the police officers, and to make all these riots, they start to offer tea and food to the officers in the street. And this is just an example to tell you how much how, how much is the nice relation and the and the and respect. the and respect between the people of Egypt and their army. Uh, they're hoping they do that that will be really the last line of defense they can use. They can go and tell them, please come down and put order on the street. That's what I just to say a few minutes ago. So that's an example that the army doesn't want to go down the street, but they have been forced to go down to the street. And up till now, Port Said is still under the army units uh, uh, in the streets and is still guarding the Port Said in the street. And every time they want to put the police back, well, they put few of them now. Uh, there's some resistance. So that is the respect between, and that example, others won't set out. If that, that is what's a very successful example in Port Said, why don't we repeat it again somewhere else? 
and that encouraged people to talk about putting army again in the, in the, the streets. Uh, let, let me clarify a point here. Uh, we are talking about two different things. We are, you know, if, if we talk about the role of the army to control rights or preserve order on, or things like that, that's, that's fine. Uh, what we are not looking for is to invite the army back to take charge of the political life. This is... They don't want this, Yeah, so this, there's a big difference. I mean, it's every, it happens everywhere in the world where the, the rights and the disorder are beyond the capabilities of the police that the army are invited, you know, to take, sometimes during national disasters and things like that, the army takes charge of restoring uh, peace and order. But this is very different from having the army back in the driving seat when it comes to the political life. I can assure you again, I assure everybody here, that the army doesn't want to touch the political life of Egypt anymore. I know that quite well. Okay, another sensitive issue which comes up in a number of the questions here is the role of the army in the, military, in the economy. Uh, estimates of the army's role in the Egyptian economy, some people say 10%, some people say 30 or 40%. There are army-owned industries. The army operates dairies, the army operates, they make jam, they make water in order to provide not only for the troops, but also to provide the consumer market. It also provides jobs for generals, retired generals. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like those jobs anyway. <laughs> I don't want them. I can run a dairy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, one of the things my boss says, it's like milking a cow, it's like uh, having a dairy that work's never done. So I don't want to own a dairy. It's apparently work's never done. Um, what should the role of the military in the Egyptian economy be going forward? Should it be stepped back? <laughs> what needs to be held to the military for national security reasons and should be allowed to remain beyond the purview of, of the open market? Okay, I, there are a couple of issues that we need to address here. Uh, the first one is whether the, the role of the, of the military in the economy is 10% or 30% or whatever. To me, this is not the relevant thing. The relevant thing is whether this is done. Do you have an estimate? I don't. I don't either. Uh, but uh, but, but, but mo is more important to me is how this activity is being overlooked. Is this being done under the rules of transparency? under the monitoring of the proper uh, organizations and the proper uh, civilian authorities that have to, 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 to observe, observe this and uh, uh, prevent any kind of, of corruption or whatever, okay? I'm not accusing uh, uh, the military activities of being corrupt, but what I'm saying is that like any other civilian activities, they have to be uh, uh, subject to uh, uh, legal monitoring like any other company. And this is according to the new constitution, it is granted. So we are going to see, I guess, this, this is being practiced uh, in a quite, uh, in a much better way. But there is another uh, sensitive issue. Uh, uh, over the last 60 years, whenever, and those in business know very well what I'm talking about, if you, if you want to, to go and do business uh, in a certain remote area on a piece of land, uh, uh, overlooking the sea or something like that, you, you, ha you always have to get the permission of the military. Uh, uh, th this is a military area, this is of strategic importance, this is, and, and you know, this is, in, in my opinion, uh, is, is really overdone. And uh, uh, this has to be, this issue has to be addressed. A lot of the uh, resources, uh, that Egypt has, like mineral resources, for example, could be located in lands that are under the military control because they are strategic, quote unquote, for, for military use. Whether this is true or not, I, I don't know. Maybe they are strategic, maybe they are not. But, but this is something that needs to be, these files need to be opened and discussed. Uh, and there is no really good reason for the military to control, you know, the, uh, uh, most of the area of the land uh, claiming that this, these are strategic uh, locations. This is, I, I believe this is more, much more important than having the military involved in, 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 in economic, as a matter of fact, being involved in economic activities is may be good for the country, may be good for the economy, maybe uh, provides uh, 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 an opportunity for growth, 
but but uh, but the other aspect is actually more critical in limiting growth in in, in my opinion right um. I just mentioned today that uh, Washington Post came uh, and interviewed me five weeks ago, and they said that 45% of the Egyptian economy is controlled by the army. I'm telling you it's 8%, and uh, I said that today this afternoon, and uh, this 8%, uh, it's very easy to know. It's 8% or more for the tax authority in Egypt because the army pays taxes for all the commercial activities, as well as the uh, what we call the central organ uh, auditing organization. It's a, it's a government identity. Mm -hmm. uh, the audit, the uh, government and public sector identities in Egypt to make sure that the, the are uh, doing the business transparently and, and in a good way. So uh, this organization comes every year and the audit uh, the commercial activities of the army which is not controlling the economy of Egypt whatsoever, because you can have 5% share in the economy, but you're still controlling the economy. That's not the case in Egypt. To control economy at anywhere, not only in Egypt, in the States, in Europe, anywhere, you have to do one of two things. Number one, to control the banking business, or to have um, and to own few banks, strong banks, then you're really playing a big role or important role in the economy, which is not the case. And the Egyptian army does not own any banks or even having a 1% share at any bank in Egypt, whether it's public sector, private sector, or foreign banks. Nothing, none. Number two, to control any economy, you have to be involved in heavy industries, heavily, which is not the case again in Egypt. The army does not own any heavy industry factory in Egypt at all. What they do, or they have been asked to do, is to be involved in small industries, like John when he said bottling water, bottling water, drinking water, because that was a short, big shortage at the time. That like now in Egypt, we still have big shortage now and then. And they said, please produce some bottling water to save the shortage. And they did that. But they are not involved at any industry, food or, or, or dairy or anything, to compete against the private sector, not a single factory. Again, the existing administration, the existing uh, president, asked the army when we, because actually a few months ago, it was a big shortage of bread. And bread is a big, very sensitive issue in Egypt. It's not like the bread here. Bread in Egypt, it means life or death. It is very, very important issue. And it's heavily subsidized. And, and heavily subsidized by the government. Then it was a big shortage of, of the bread. So these, they asked the army, please go and do something about it. And they opened a big bakery producing three and a half million piece a day, selling it on the price and the normal price, subsidy price, <coughs> with the highest quality. It's not that, that like the small one, it's a really good one. <laughs> and it, because in Egypt, the, the, the normal bread is like that, but the other one is big like that. Anyway, and the highest quality, good quality. The point is that the, the prime minister, the existing prime minister, went in Helwan, that was in Helwan. Helwan is a poor area. And he opened and, and, and actually launched that bakery. So they don't, they don't, I want to, for instance, this, this bakery, they don't make any money out of it. Why? Because it's subsidized from the government. So they put from their own money the cost of that bakery, which is a huge bakery, automatic one, to produce three and a half million pieces a day without taking anything. One of my friends here, my, my colleagues here, Khalid, was, was telling me in the morning, they can make profit. Sometimes they do the service without profit to make people happy. So that's what they do. So they are not involved in heavy industries, they don't control banks, and most of their production is service production without competing to any public sector or private sector products. Thank you. Um, you agree with me? <laughs> um, I know that you know a lot about that because of the GAFI. <laughs> <laughs> there was discussion earlier about how we're sort of in a transitional period. One of the points I've been pushing you on is, is are there things that aren't subject 
to negotiation. One of, the, one of the questions that's come up from a number of you is the question of Israel. Egypt's strategic orientation, not only vis-a-vis -vis the United States far away and the, relationship, <laughs> and the relationship that General Zinni <laughs> talked about, but the relationship much closer, which quite frankly doesn't enjoy a lot of public support in Egypt. Are there parts of Egypt's strategic orientation which should not be subject to democratic processes? Are there treaty commitments which Egypt should commit it will not touch regardless of the desires of whatever parliament and president are in power? You ask him, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know what he thinks. <laughs> I'm waiting for you. Yeah. This, uh, this time you'll answer first. <laughs> it's nice to see him smiling. Yeah. <laughs> I always smile, but not now. Because, uh, uh, I, like it's, to it's, I mean, our position is very clear and very well known. It has been, you know, publicized many times. Is that uh, uh, Egypt is a country that respects its uh, international commitments. Uh, whenever there is a treaty or you know, or an agreement is signed by any government. Uh, this is something that is respected by uh, by our government, and uh, this is number one. Number two, Egypt is 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 very much interested in having peace. Okay, particularly at this critical stage of its uh, of its history. Uh, the last thing that Egypt would need right now is to get involved in any sort of conflict with anybody. This is, uh, this is natural. Long term. I mean, the question is we're in transitional, we're thinking long term. Are there things that should be walled off yeah. as Egypt thinks about I, I'm getting to that. Okay. Uh, the thing is that, as you said, uh, uh, the relationship between Israel and Egypt has not been very popular. And that was actually applicable during Mubarak's time. Not, not, not just now. I mean, the relationships uh, were never normalized as people wanted when the treaties were signed, okay? Which indicated that, it, that there is something wrong. And uh, this, whatever is wrong, has to be fixed. Uh, and, uh, and the Egyptian people believe that Egypt has always been respecting its commitment uh, in accordance with uh, the treaty while Israel hasn't. And this is pro one of the main reasons for not really being very happy and, and for the treaty not being very popular in Egypt. As a matter of fact, I met President Carter a couple of times during the last two years. In, in he visited Egypt as part of his activities in observing elections. And he also once visited us in the Constituent Assembly. And he, he told me very clearly that he 100% acknowledges that Egypt has respected its commitment to the treaties, while Israel, Israel hasn't. Of course, President Carter was the guardian of that treaty. And particularly, that was related to, to the Camp David Acc Accords when it comes to the rights of the Palestinians. Uh, many aspects of the, related to the rights of the Palestinians were really included in the Camp David Acc Accords, but they were never respected. But I believe the, the situation will definitely, with the long term, it will change. Because now, before Israel was, it was very easy for Israel to deal with one person, close a deal, and, 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 and things are done. But uh, right now, in a democracy, as you said, uh, Israel must realize that whatever the Egyptian people is looking for will be reflected on the acts of the, of the, of the administration. Uh, so this will definitely lead to uh, more, I hope, more work on the Israeli side to uh, uh, take care of, uh, of its commitments, respect its commitments, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is the best way to maintain peace. Uh, this is, in summary, what we can do. Right. Uh, we do have a peace treaty, uh, which I believe has to be changed uh, uh, as soon as possible, I hope, uh, the, uh, from my point of view. It, it has to be respected, and it is respected uh, so far. Uh, the point is, 33 years ago, uh, 79, when this uh, peace treaty has been signed, 
There was an appendix called security appendix. Uh, item three and five, they're talking about uh, zone A, B, and C in Sinai, D in, in the Israeli side. And it tells you how much units and soldiers and officers and uh, weaponry you have to keep at every uh, zone, A, B, and C. 33 years ago, situation was not like today. Today, we have Iran involved in the area. They are supplying Hamas with financially and technically and weapons. There were no, there, at the time, there were no tunnels under the border between Egypt and Gaza Strip. Now we have hundreds of tunnels underneath, smuggling weapons and products and goods between the two sides, going and coming back, which is very, very dangerous in Egypt, for Egypt in particular. Uh, again, political situation was different. Hamas was not there at all. Hamas was, was, there was no Hamas at the time, or at least there was no Hamas in Gaza Strip at the time. So the political situation has changed. The security situation inside Sinai has changed. Now we have in Sinai the younger brother of Ayman al-Zawahri, which is the head of Al-Qaeda. He's having his group in Sinai called Salafiya Jihadiyya, Muhammad al-Zawahri. And he is the one, again, between two brackets, responsible for killing the 15 officers, uh, army officers, in, in 5th of August last year, <coughs> according to what information is still available, with the help from Gaza Strip people, when came from through the tunnels, and they did what they did. Fifteen times exploding uh, or blowing up the pipe gas gas pipeline from Egypt to Israel has been done by them. So everybody is saying that Mohammed Zawahri, the head of that group in northern Sinai, is taking orders from. Al-Qaeda, from his brother. We don't know yet, is it true or not, but they are brothers. There is no question about that. So the situation is different, completely different now in the area. Do we have to sit down again and talk about zone B and C in particular? Forget about A, I think it's an essential. It's a, I think it's a must. I think we are late for that. We should have done that a long time ago, or at least a couple of years ago. And I'm saying that every day in the media in Egypt, in the television, when I have the chance to talk in one of the programs, I mention that. It's good for everybody that we have to sit again in the table with the presence of the American side, because they were the present at the time for the, uh, uh, that treaty in 1970, March 1979. And I think we have to sit down and talk about it. I'm not talking about the Israel. They are very touchy regarding any items in, in the agreement. We, not, we don't want to talk about the agreement. The agreement, take it aside. We are talking about one appendix, security appendix, two items in particular. And I know exactly which clause I want. B and C, yeah, I, I can tell you. Item, item one to five in clause number two, item one to six in clause number seven. That's what we want to talk about. If we do that, believe me, it's good for everybody. Rather than that, the diplomatic relation is kind of normal, kind of normal. Egyptian ambassador is not there. Uh, he is withdrawn, and he's in Cairo now for the last few months, uh, according to the, to the uh, order of, uh, of the perm existing administration in Cairo after the Gaza, uh, um, I would say, raid. Uh, but the Israeli Israel ambassador comes two or three days a week, right? Who? The Israeli ambassador. I was just in Tel Aviv, but comes every day, every week, once a day. Uh, yeah, once or two days. Yeah, one day, two days. Uh, but there is no embassy in, in Cairo now because the, 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 their embassy has been attacked several times, and they said we get, they're going to try to find another place, which they didn't up till now. So, but uh, I would say there is only three uh, administrative at the Shays or something, they are in Cairo, but everybody else is not there. But legally, officially, yes, the relation is, is there. But legally or officially, they have a diplomatic relation between the two sides, but it is not practically on ground. We're, we're running out of time. Let me come back to one of the points that you first opened with, and that is uh, thinking about military education, young people, how to educate people into a different kind of civil-military <coughs> relationship than Egypt's had mm. for the last 60 years. 
<clears throat> if you're thinking now about how to get Egypt to where you think Egypt needs to be 20 years ago on the civil military side, what are the steps you need to take with the military? What are the steps you need to take with the civilians to educate them to know enough to both have some oversight of each other, understand each other, and not be threatened by each other? Well, I, I mean, I think the United States' role is not to obviously dictate how Egypt is going to govern itself and how these things are going to work out. But I think there are things we can offer to help with. Obviously, we have a long-term relationship with the military, uh, now going into its third decade of really a strong relationship. Their officers and, and NCOs come to our schools, and part of our ed officer education is the role of the military in a democracy, and they're certainly exposed to that. I think one of the things that's critically important is, you know, we, we haven't done anything like that on the political side. I, I know there was an issue when our State Department went over with a couple million dollars and started fairy dusting it around the streets and there was concern as to who was getting that money and who the parties were and how they were handling it. No offense, Michelle. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and so I do think what we've lacked on uh, and, and we could help with is some way we coordinate civil military assistance in developing capacity. It, you know, it, we, I heard this sort of back and forth that you went through about use of the military and security missions. We've used our military. We, we, back, we federalized our National Guard. The governors have called them up in circumstances. Uh, you know, our, our military has been used for domestic issues. If you go back to the race riots in the 70s and all, we went up to the Capitol Military District, the Marines, and uh, had riot control. But we were always under civilian control. We have a law, posse comitatus. So I think there are things in terms of the way you structure it, how you develop the capacity for civilian leadership in, in these environments, uh, and, and still take advantage of what the military could provide. I do agree, they, they are respected on the street, by and large, in, in Egypt. You don't want to lose that respect, certainly. I think you could gain more respect by seeing not just a strong military, but a strong uh, political development. As the parties develop, as the institutions develop, you'll grab the models that you see that best fit you. You know, democracy has many different shades and flavors. Uh, every time I go to the UK, I'm trying to figure that democracy out. And, you know, when I sit up above and watch the parliament go at it. But, you know, uh, so it, it, it will be something that has to accommodate your culture, has to accommodate you know, in your case, there's a very strong religious undertone to this, how much of secularism and modernity impact on that, how you sort it out. You're probably in a better position to do that than many of the other countries in the region that are having much more difficulty with that. So if you ask me what the U.S. role is, I think we need to continue this relationship with the military. We need to really focus on this, uh, uh, on, on the education piece, the cooperation piece and keeping stability in the region. Uh, staying together and, and, and being, in a military term, interoperable. But I would like to see much more investment on the political and economic side to help you with institution building. And again, not dictating, but finding a way that it reaches, you know, what's culturally acceptable and how it works for you. You know, we couldn't have had two people like you sitting on this stage maybe 10 years ago in this kind of discussion. Three. And, and the fact that you're friends and you could disagree with each other, you're heading in the same direction and there's going to be bumps on the road, and maybe you can't see it now. But I have faith in, you know, the, the oldest civilization in this room. I would just say one other thing about retired military officers. Don't hammer them too much. I think our governor here in Virginia is a retired military guy. See, it's not all <laughs> easy. So, uh, Come on, look at that. So be gentle with us. <laughs> see? Do you want to come in? Uh, I, I, I perfectly agree with uh, General Zaini's uh, remarks, and uh, I guess uh, we are, we are, Egypt is in a stage now where everything is being redefined, not just the relationship between the military and the civilian. The, 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 there has to be a definition of, the, of the, how the political life is being run, how the uh, institutions are established, how the security is maintained, how the, how the economy is run. Everything is under definition. This is a transitional period. It's very important to, to try to lead as peaceful as possible uh, this, through this transitional period. But the, in, in our view, the most important thing to happen is to complete the establishment of the democratic institutions. And uh, Egypt, 
uh, compared with other uh, countries in the region that went through similar conditions, I believe that w went really uh, very good steps uh, uh, compared to these countries. We, we have uh, an elected, a democratically elected president. We have a constitution. We are about to have uh, uh, to complete the other chamber of the parliament. And this is a priority. To, w once we establish the democratic institutions, <coughs> we'd be in a very good position to really redefine everything in the country and head and go I mean, lead a, a, a much better uh, path for the prosperity of our country. General? Well, I think the uh, army now enjoying uh, a really excellent relation with the civilian uh, side. I, I'm not talking about everybody in Egypt, but at least with the majority. Uh, even some of the is Islamists now, uh, they, they give the same respect and, uh, and same kind of uh, appreciation to uh, the Egyptian army. Um, again, uh, I'm, we're not talking about changing, I fully agree with, at, at least once with my friend here, <laughs> <laughs> but we are good friends anyway. Uh, that yes, it will take some time, definitely, and and changing the the uh, the, the the idea of having the army in the same life with the civilians, and the army will not be involved in anything; will do his job only. Uh, I think this is uh, again uh, uh, the uh, perception. This is what the army wants. The uh, one thing which I'd like really to uh, to to mention that. The Egyptian army now, uh, with, the, with the highest qualification of, of uh, being ready to do his job and other jobs, civilian jobs like what we're talking about and others, uh, is going to be involved, whether he likes it or not, in the security, in the internal security of the country uh, for a while. Whether this will be um, uh, appreciated by some groups like the Islamists in Egypt or not, but uh, again, with the condition of the police force in Egypt, which is very weak and they are not very, uh, I would say, professional. I don't like really to, to, to take, talk bad words about them, but uh, maybe they need help. Uh, uh, that help will be provided only by the army, and this is what the people is going to see uh, in the future. Uh, so the question is, are you going to see the army again in the streets? In, uh, in my assumption, yes. Um, this is a very sensitive topic which our panelists have handled uh, with great skill and insight. Please uh, join me in thanking Colonial Wilmsburg for hosting us, thanking them for sharing their wisdom. Thank you for coming.